We gather together to worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. O oh Lord, you are our help in times of trouble, but so often I do not look to you in trouble. I try to solve my own problems with my own strength and my own resources. I forget that even my own strength and resources are a gift from you. Forgive me. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with its turmoil. We know that we do not need to fear, and yet we are afraid. We fear for our health. We fear for our country. We fear for our families. Forgive us and reassure us with your ever-present help. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. O oh God, we want to hide in your dwelling place. We know that with you we cannot fall. Protect us, Lord. Nations rage. Kingdoms topple. The earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come see the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears to pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. We are in awe of your amazing power. Stop the wars and discord in our world and in our nation. Help us. Stop fighting and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. We fight and we strive for what we think we deserve. Forgive us and let us acknowledge you as God, the exalted one. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. You are our stronghold. You are with us even though we have sinned against you. Bring us grace and forgiveness. We need you. As we come to the Lord and we ask him for his grace and forgiveness, he looks to us and he says that I love you and I forgive you. And he does that because of what Jesus has done for you. Jesus died for you so that you can be forgiven. You're forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. time for us to greet one another with the peace of the Lord. Uh, we can't, of course, give each other hugs, but we certainly can look around and see who's here and greet people. Sixteen, 
is the is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes believe in, in him will never die but have eternal life. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. So put your faith in Jesus Christ and your soul will never die, will never die. Will never die. Great song. I got somebody who's going to help us today with our message. But first, all right, got somebody here that's going to help us. This is Sigmund. But before we talk to Sigmund, let's pray together. Okay, ready? Hold your hands. Dear God, thank you that you love us and care for us each and every day. Amen. Well, do you know... Hi, Sigmund. Hello. How are you folks? Hey, you kids are here. Oh, he likes you guys. That's great. Did you know that, that this week there's a special holiday? Yeah, uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. You know what it is? It's Halloween. Well, Sigmund, I was thinking of a church holiday. A church holiday? You kids know what it is? Yeah. You don't know what it is? I thought it was Halloween. I'm going to dress up like a red puppet. what I'm going to do. You guys think that you should dress up like a red puppet? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, the, the special holiday is a time called Reformation. Reformation? That's a weird word. What does that mean? You kids know what it means? Oh, well, Sigmund, I have something that will help us. Let me see if I can reach in my pocket. I have a little toy. Let's see. Oh, let me drop something in there, too. I can't reach it. Here's my little Martin Luther action figure. How many of you have a Martin Luther action figure, right? And he's a little guy. He's really little. Was Martin Luther really that little? Do you think he was really that little? This is just a toy, right? It's just a toy. But this toy, was, his name is made after a man that helped us to discover something. Why do you think he's carrying and holding on to a feather? He's a bird! Do you think he's a bird? He's not a bird. <laughs> I think he's a bird. He's not! Well, why do you think he is where he's holding a feather? Well, the feather was like a pen. It's because he wrote things. And what do you think he wrote? He wrote that God loves us very, very, very much. And it's not what you do that makes God love you. God just loves you. He said all that with his feather? No! Yeah, I, I, that's pretty cool. But no. he, he also has something else. What's that he's got there? Oh, I know, I know, I know. It's a book. He's got a book. What book do you think it is? The Bible. That's right. Because all of his teaching comes from the Bible. All of his teaching. And we learned from Martin Luther, we learned that God loves us so much that he'll never stop loving us and that all of our teaching should come from God's word in the Bible. Wow, that's pretty cool. Isn't that wonderful? Hey, kids, I think Reformation's a great day to celebrate, don't you? So how about if we all say to all the big people back there, Happy Reformation Day. Ready? On the count of three, Happy Reformation Day. One, two, three, Happy Reformation Day. I think I was the only one that did it. Come on, guys. Happy, Happy Reformation Day. Maybe the big people can say it to you. Ready, big people? Happy Reformation Day! Okay. Hey, why don't you say a prayer? Okay, I'm going to say a prayer. Let's hold our hands. 
Dear God, thank you for loving us as much as you love us and for giving us the Bible so we know your word. Amen. All right, you can go to Children's Church. See you later. See you guys later. Our epistle lesson is taken from the book of Romans. And in this reading, Paul explained, explained what was to become the heart of the Reformation. It is faith that truly fulfills the law. We've all sinned, but God makes us righteous. We hold on to that righteousness by trusting in God's promises, and this is what God wants from us. Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. No one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one, justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By, one, by one's of works? No, on the contrary, by a law of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Be we arise, if you're able, to listen to the gospel. It comes from John in the 8th chapter. In today's special good news, we hear how it is God's truth that truly sets us free. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really are free. This is the special good news of the Lord.
Let's uh, pray together. Father, we thank you so much uh, for your wonderful love for us in giving us uh, the Reformation. And we pray that today as we learn and we grow, that you will work in our hearts to make us the people that you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, to rely on you as our strong and good fortress. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to have all of you folks uh, that are online with us. It's wonderful to see you here celebrating with us. So most of you, I think, have some Lutheran background. So some of you are familiar with the story of the Reformation, right? A little bit. Anybody? Yeah? Hope so. Uh, you've heard of Martin Luther. Um, and I turned off my thing so it's not going to move in. There we go. He was a law student. And when he was trying to go back home from where he... Or no, I think he was going back to his school. He got caught in a terrible, awful thunderstorm. And when he got caught in that terrible, awful thunderstorm, he thought he was going to die. I mean, the, the rains came down and the, the thunder was, was, uh, was really loud and it struck really close to him. And he thought for sure he was going to die. So you know what he did? He called out. And who did he call out to? Now, he called out to St. Anne. He called it to St. Anne. He said, St. Anne, help me. If you help me, I'll become a monk. Now, God used that, but he certainly didn't have it all together. His fortress wasn't his mighty fortress. Instead, he was just looking for anything he could to help him because he didn't know where to call out. So he called out, St. Anne, help me, and I'll become a monk. And he did survive, and so he did what he said he was going to do. And then he found out that there wasn't only a storm on the outside, there was also a storm on the inside. And he struggled, and he tried to do all the things you're supposed to do as a monk. You're supposed to do all of this stuff, and you're supposed to do it to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that you're right with God. But he couldn't find peace. He felt like no matter how hard he tried, he didn't try hard enough. He, he just wasn't enough. There wasn't enough there for him. So, so he kept finding the struggle on the inside. And he looked at God, but God didn't look like a mighty fortress. God looked like a scary fortress. God was a judging God who said, you're not good enough, Marty. You're not good enough. And so God continually uh, was, was a, a pressure on Luther. And he struggled with that for a long, long time. Until as he was studying God's word, he came across... Oh, I did this first service too. One of the things that he discovered at this point in his life that later he wrote in those 95 theses that he put on the door, number 14 said, the smaller the love, the greater the fear. And for Luther, that was the case. Because he thought that God didn't love him, and so he was scared to death. And he didn't love God because he saw God as an evil God that was just judging him and was threatening him with eternal torment. And so Luther 
couldn't love a God like that. And so he was more and more and more afraid. That's where he was at. And at that point, that's when he came across this Bible verse. Read with me. For in the gospel, read with me. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Well, when Luther first read this, he saw this word righteous, and he thought, God is righteous. God's right. God, God is his, the righteousness of God is his righteousness, and I can't live up to that. And he struggled with that until he came to this word at the bottom that said, the righteous will live by faith. And he thought, faith, faith, what does that mean? What does it mean to have faith? What, what am I supposed to believe? What is it that I'm supposed to trust at this point in my life? You know, I'm not finding any comfort in God. I believe there's a God there, but I believe that God is going to torch me. So he struggled with that until he came across this, the gospel. And the gospel is, it, I think, expressed really well in this verse. Read with me. God was using Christ to restore his relationship with humanity. He didn't hold people's faults against them. See, this was the good news that Luther heard. It was this idea that God, who was the creator of the universe, had come into our world and took sin upon himself. And so if we want to know how God feels about us, we don't look out there someplace. We don't look at the storms that we can see out there. And we don't look inside of our heart, but we look to Jesus on the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus died to show what God really feels about us, what he really thinks about us. He looks at us and we say, we look at ourselves and we say, you know what? I messed up. We look at the world and we say, yeah, the world's messed up. But we look at Jesus on the cross and we say, God cares. And he really cares about me and he really cares about you. And that message is right there on the cross. And because of that, Luther's whole world was transformed. He had a different view. He, he understood this, that regardless of whether the storm rages on the outside, like that thunderstorm that night, or on the inside, like it was when he was in the monastery trying to find peace. God is our good fortress. If you look at Jesus, you know that God is always good. I was, uh, went to a, an African congregation one time. And they would say this over and over again. They would say, God is good. And the people would respond, all the time. And then the pastor would say, all the time. And the people would say, God is good. And that's really the statement of faith that we have. God is good all the time. Let's try that again. God is good all the time. God is good. Yeah. Yeah, and he said that, because, and I thought that was a great expression of faith, and that's what Luther understood. Because in our world, you know, we look outside and we see the coronavirus. We look outside and we see the political upheaval. We see, we see the, the hurricanes and all these storms that are happening. And we could name tons and tons of other stuff that's really bad out there. And if we look at those things, we might get afraid. But if we look at our fortress, who is Jesus, who came for us and died for us and rose from the dead for us, then we know that God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And we might look inside our hearts. And what do we see there? We see sin. Or we look in our hearts and we see anxiety. People struggle with that. You know, I, I, you know, I, I just, just worries that are always there. Or we might look inside of our hearts and see shame and guilt for things that we've done. But again, we have to hear that message that God is our good fortress. And we believe that. And we hold on to that. No matter what it looks like on the outside or the inside, God is good. And understanding that changed Luther's life. He realized that he had a, a refuge. Let's read this. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who's always found in times of trouble. Yeah, a refuge, a place where you can go, a fortress. When you're inside a fortress, you don't have to be afraid because you know that you're safe inside that fortress. You know that you are there, and that's something that God has, has, has provided for us. And Luther started to understand it. That's where he wrote that hymn that we sang just a few minutes ago. Uh, a mighty fortress is our God. And this one was a, a bulwark. There's different versions of it, so I was a little bit they're trying to get the, the thing. Yeah, he's, he's a bulwark. He's a strong thing that we can hold on to. And that, when Luther finally found a faithful fortress, then it changed his life. And instead of cowering in fear in the monastery because his sins were too big or cowering in a thunderstorm, he was able to stand before the Pope and be able to make that confession, to be able to stand there when the Pope said, 
Luther, you've got to get rid of all these books that you've written. You've got to recant them because they aren't what the Catholic Church teaches. And he said, no, unless I can see by Scripture or by plain reason that there's something wrong in there, I will not recant. Here I stand. So help me, God. And he stood on that confession, and he wasn't afraid even at the cost of possibly his life because they were threatening his life, and he knew that. But he could stand there. Why? Because he had the courage to act because he had a strong fortress. Faith in a good fortress gives us courage to act. And it gives us courage to act in our lives as well. We're, we're probably not going to stand before a council sometime and give witness. But we are going to stand in our communities. And we're going to reach out to the people that we see. And God gives us that courage to act because we know that we have a good God. And I would love to stop right here and say, okay, it's, um, it's done. It's good. We know we've got a real strong thing we can hold on to. But as Luther went forward, he didn't always stand on that firm fortress. But, uh, we should be uh, pretty bothered by it. So let's look forward. He wrote this, this uh, tract called Against the Murdering Thieving Hordes. It was during the time of the Peasants' Revolt. The peasants felt like their lives were miserable. And because their lives were miserable, they revolted and they, they had a riot. And Luther, who was very conservative, said, no, we don't want that. We don't want anybody rioting. And so he wrote against them and he wrote to the princes and he said that you should put down this uprising with as much force as you have. And he wrote these words, which I think are terrible. He wrote, they must be sliced, choked, stabbed secretly and publicly by those who can, like one must kill a rabid dog. See, Luther, Luther spoke out against uh, the uprising of the peasants. And sometimes we say, yeah, oh, he's a strong guy. But then the princes came out. There were 100,000 peasants that were killed. 100,000. They had no weapons. They just had their farm implements. And then the weapons of the, the prince and all those folks, they just overrode them. And it was terrible carnage. Isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? It was an awful thing. And for us, we, we think, oh, man, you know, this is, this is the guy that we say was the founder of, of the Lutheran church, right? What do we do with that? He also wrote about the Jews later in his life. See, he had hoped that the Jewish people would come to faith in Jesus. And he thought everything would be great. We'll talk to the Jews. And when they understand the real gospel and not this gospel of works, they're going to just flock into the church, was his idea, right? They're all going to just come running in. And it didn't happen, and so he got angry, and he wrote this tract about the lies of the Jews and said that we should burn their synagogues. And even some of his words that were used against the Jews were used by Hitler later. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Right? To think that's something that Martin Luther wrote. Well, I think all of us should recognize that it wasn't just Luther that has blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. Let's read this verse from Jesus. If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. See, Jesus said, look, if, if you think you've got it all figured out, you don't. It's the humility of recognizing that we don't have all the answers. Jesus said, you've got blind spots. And the Pharisees and Sadducees said, no, we understand how God works. We've got it figured out. Jesus says, no, man, that's not the attitude that you need. You've got to realize that we don't have all the answers. And that humility of knowing that we don't have all the answers allows us then to come to Jesus and find his answers and his grace. I love this Phoenix comic strip. I hear you're writing a book on theology. I hope you have a good title, Charlie Brown says. Uh, Snoopy responds, I have a perfect title. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? Now the fact is, is that we do theology. We study about God and we learn about him. And there are things that we can hold on to, the truth of Jesus. We can hold on to those main core truths. But we also have to do it humbly, recognizing that we're human. And just like Luther who had the, the wonderful understanding of the gospel that we are saved by God's grace alone and that was such a wonderful and transforming thing that all of us are able to partake in and participate in. At the same time we recognize he was a human. And he had blind spots, just like all of us. And, and those blind spots sometimes were awful. We all have blind spots that, that obscure our understanding of our good fortress. Now here's the question then, because he had blind spots and did bad things, should we go and topple over all of the Luther statues? 
Should we cancel Luther and say we don't want to have anything more to do with him because he had bad things that were in his life? I think the reality is, as Lutherans, we understand that we are all sinner saints, that we're all sinners, and even though we believe in that very good gospel, there are times that we sin in our own personal lives and even publicly. And when we recognize that, that gives us the humility to turn back to Jesus. I think one of the things we can learn from this is this. Let's read this verse. There is a river. Its streams delight in the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. That river is a river of grace. The living water of the Holy Spirit comes out of Jesus. We don't have all the answers, but we do know a Jesus who does. And we're able to accept his love and forgiveness in our life. We don't have to pretend that we have all the answers. We don't have to pretend that, that we know everything. And we can recognize that we're going to have blind spots. Because I'll tell you something, if you study history, every single generation in the past history has had something that we can go back and say they didn't get it. And you know what? Someday people are going to look back at our generation and they're going to say they didn't get it. Because why? Because we're sinful human beings and we don't have a corner on the truth. But we do know the truth. And the truth is in a person, Jesus Christ. And we'll just hold on to that one person and we can deal with those blind spots and say, Lord, open our eyes. Allow us to recognize that you are our truth and that we don't know all of the answers. And from there, I think we can also... Oh, God's grace is our good fortress against blind spots. The fact is, is that we can recognize. We don't have to be afraid. Yeah, we're going to get some things wrong. That's okay. God loves us. He sent his son to die for us. We're forgiven. We're his people. And that, that allows us to have an attitude of learning. Read this verse with me. Let a wise person listen and increase learning. Let a wise person listen and increase learning. That's the attitude we should have as, as Christians going into the world. How do we continue to learn? I love the story. This is not the attitude we should have, but the story of the, of the five rabbis that were... Uh, um, were arguing. And the one rabbi said, this is the truth. This is the way it is. I know it's right. And the other four said, no, it's not. You are wrong. And he said, no. He said, I am right. I don't care what you guys say. I know that God is on my side. I am right. And they said, well, there's four of us and only one of you. And he said, no, I am right. I am sure I am right. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, there was a big light and it shone down into the room and it, where he was at. And the big voice came from heaven and there was this, this heavenly music ah, in the background. And he said, he is right. Listen to him. He said, see? And the other ones all were taken aback by this huge scene. And then they looked forward and said, yeah, okay. So now it's four against two. <laughs> you follow that, right? Okay, the, the fact is sometimes we're like that. It doesn't matter if God says it. We kind of think that we know the truth. The attitude of, of humble learning says we're willing to recognize that we might not have all the answers. We might not have all the answers. And I think our place in Jesus as our good fortress is what helps us. Let's read this verse. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roars and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil. When you're in a solid fortress, I love this picture. If you see this man, he doesn't look too bothered by all that water, does he? Why? Because he knows he's in a solid place. When we're solid in our faith in Jesus Christ, when we're solid there, we don't have to be afraid of other people's ideas. We don't have to be afraid of, of the rest of the world. We hold tight in Jesus, and then we're able to listen, and we're able to learn, and we're able to interact with other people. Why? Because no matter what they throw at us, we know that we have that solid relationship with Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again. That's the firm foundation that we hold on. And so we're with that, we can go ahead and engage the world and learn from the world. That's okay. Because we know that that's never going to topple. Our strong foundation is not going to topple. We are in it. And Jesus is keeping us safe there. So what have we learned? First, regardless of whether the storm rages on the outside or the inside, God is our good fortress. Faith in a good fortress gives us courage to act. We all have blind spots that obscure our 
understanding of our good fortress. God's grace is our good fortress against our blind spot. Any questions or comments? Concerns? Complaints? Let's take a minute um, and think about what we've heard. Think about what's going to be different in our life now that we've heard this message. How is God going to use this message in our life this week? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus is our mighty fortress. Thank you, Betty. I think that's true. You know, the thing is, we don't want to um, just take what we hear here and leave and forget about it. We want to put it into our hearts and, and make it make a difference in our life. Let's pray together. Father, you are our mighty and good fortress. You're the place that keeps us safe, whether the storms are on the inside or the outside. You're the place where we can rest safe and know that even as we interact with others that have different ideas than us, we have our firm foundation in you, and we have a place where we can stay safe in you. And that allows us to be humble and able to learn. Lord, we pray that we can be the people that you've called us to be, to give witness to your wonderful love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue with the Apostles' Creed. Let's stand to confess it. If you're comfortably able. If you don't want to, that's okay too. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's uh, join with prayer. I don't know if you're more comfortable praying, standing up, or sitting down. Either is okay. But I encourage you just to, to relax yourself and to allow yourself to come into the presence of the Lord as we pray to Him. Let us pray for the church here and around the world and for all people in their varied circumstances. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Strengthen the church here, wherever it gathers around your word and celebrates the blessed sacrament. Grant confident faith to clergy and laity, pastors in congregations and missionaries in distant lands, elders in the faith, the newly baptized alike. We pray that those with special health or other needs this day, pray for those with special health or other needs this day, including, please feel free to name those for whom you wish to pray. Father, we lift up to you those that have cancer, especially Lynn. We ask that you will protect her from the side effects from her medication and allow those uh, side effects to settle down so that she can get back to feeling normal. We pray for Travis as he continues his uh, fight against cancer, and Denise and Dawn and Patty, Tony, Jason, and Mary. Father, we lift up to you Catalina Morales. Um, Dona Lucia's grandmother with her broken hip in Mexico, continue to watch over her. You know, it would be our desire that, uh, that Dona Lucia would be able to go and visit her. Father, we continue to pray for Tiago, uh, who has these unexplained symptoms that they don't know exactly what caused them. We pray that he will have complete and total healing. Be with David as he recovers from a heart attack, from Max and his serious leg injury. Continue to lift up Brooke, as Betty had mentioned. Uh, we're afraid that there'll be no infection for her. Be with ba baby Matmat, um, who has his heterotaxy syndrome, and his parents aren't able to visit him, and they just it, it's just really a hard situation for them. We put them into your almighty hands. Be with Josh and Coco and John as they prepare to return to Asia for their mission work. We pray for the ladies 
of the Copper Valley that are fighting cancer and for all the families that are positive with COVID-19. Father, we lift up to you the work of the 3W Medical Clinic for Women in Seattle as they serve women uh, with your love. Lord, we pray for our preschool as we come back together and, and uh, serve the families that come and have entrusted their kids to us. Father, we also lift up to you, Jack, as he recovers from his fall. We put all of these people into your almighty hands. Help us put all our trust in your protection and power. Lord, in your mercy, strong creator, wherever people call out to you as the earth gives way, mountains move into the heart of the sea and mountains tremble. Hear their cries and keep them safe. Awaken courage and wisdom in those who search and rescue, those who provide physical and spiritual counsel, those who offer long-term support of body and life. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Holy Spirit, when nations rage and kingdoms totter, use the earthly powers that be to move the nations that their leaders and their leaders to seek ways towards peace with their neighbors and stability within their borders. Especially bless the nations of Palau, Nauru, New Chalcedonia, that they may be places where people may seek and follow you. You who make war cease to the end of the earth, provide courage and compassion to all who work for peace and protection as they are deployed abroad, and all who maintain concord and order within our communities. We especially pray for our police, including Chief Jolly, Kent, and Jennifer, as they serve in their vocations. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, stream joy and gladness to those who wait for the dawning of a new day, those dealing with long-term ills, unemployment, discrimination, unjust imprisonment, strife in their families, loss of loved ones, especially for families like those listed on our sign that have losses due to violence and injustice. Give healing and justice to our land. Assure them that you are with them, even now, a very present help in trouble. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, worthy to be exalted among the nations, into your almighty hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray. Hear our prayer for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray the words you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray for, for God's supply and God's offering. Fathers, you have supplied everything for us, and we return to you gifts um, out of that bounty. We pray that you'll use those gifts for the good of your church and the good of your world. We pray that this church will be a light, a light to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the benediction of the Lord. Benediction means the blessing. It means God's good words. For all that God can do within us, for all that God can do without us. For all in whom God, in whom Christ lived before us. For all in whom Christ lives beside us. For all the Spirit wants to bring us. For where the Spirit wants to send us. The blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is with you and will be with you on your way together now and forevermore. Let's sing our final song.
with the prayer you fed the hungry, with the word you stilled the sea, yet you silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. With a shout you rose victorious, rushing victory from the grave. And ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.